Okay guys, let's quickly talk about this dark thing here because it's a pretty interesting concept that I've kind of seen before, but it really brings it one step further. Whether it's useful to you or not, that's another question entirely and that's why I need to go through that and what exactly it is and what exactly it can or cannot do. Uh, spoiler alert, it feels a bit like a, a jack of all trades, master of none, and that's pretty much exactly what it is. Let me show you a bit closer. Okay, so here is what I'm looking at. This is the largest scope in a telescope by Tobtech called the GS series. The smallest is the GS150, which costs, I think, 149 US dollars. And the largest is this guy here, the GS350, that costs, uh, what is it, 220 US dollars, roughly. So very cheap telescopes. And GS actually stands for guide scope. But I have I don't know, a cold camera on it, and I have a focuser attached to it. So what gives? And also, just a quick remark, this guy here is F6. The 300 is F6 as well. Anything underneath 250, 200, 150 are F5 telescopes, and they are all triplets. Triplet telescopes at a low price that are labeled as guide scopes. And so, okay, what is going on here? Also, why am I able to fit, normally, as anything else, an electronic focuser to my guide scope? It makes no sense. And it makes even more no sense <laughs> by the fact that there's, like, besides the, the size differences, the sizes that are available, there's another thing, the focuser type can be chosen. You can choose a Crayford type, type of focuser with which you will not be able to fit in an EF, or you can choose a rack and pinion type of focuser. It's the same price. You just choose when you buy. And with the rack and pinion, you can use an EF or you don't have to. Initially, it came with two nice focus knobs on each, on each side so I could focus manually. But I removed them and I put the EF using one of the couplers. And actually, this coupler was provided by Tech. And then at the end, I have attached a cool astrophotography camera. Uh, for the fun, I've attached an APS-C size camera, even though Tech recommends up to one inch, something like the 533 uh, cameras. Now, this triplet design as well, it is what Tech calls a papo design, which means basically Petzval, meaning that as long as you reach focus, you don't have to care about back focus, the distance between the flange of the telescope and your camera sensor. And, and at, the, at the same time, uh, this guy here has M42 threads, which is why I was able to just screw in my camera as usual. But it also comes with three screw holes together with a compression ring so that you can put in a guide camera instead. Or you can put a 1.25 inch diagonal and use it for visual astronomy. And I've tested it and it works. All of those modes work. And we'll look at the results on the computer later, but the results of actual astrophotography with the telescope, which is a 220 US dollars guide scope, are surprisingly good. Not perfect, but surprisingly good. We'll have a look a bit later in this video. Uh, so yeah, stay tuned. So you can start to see why I'm referring to this as a jack of all trades, master of none. Because one of the reasons is that as a guide scope, Without the focuser, it's great actually. You'll be able to just get in focus pretty easily. It's a pretty nice focusing mechanism and then you lock it in place. There's almost zero shift when you lock it in place and then you're good to go for guiding. It works great, nice. And assuming, I assume that because it's the same mechanical parts, it's going to be the same with all of the smaller versions of this telescope. The 150 is tiny. This thing is huge, right? But if you're some, looking for something smaller, which probably makes more sense. Like the 350, I don't think makes sense for a lot of people. I just wanted to test the largest ones, <laughs> uh, but that's it. Uh, someone normal would go for the 200, maybe the 250 if you're feeling like generous. Uh, but uh, I think the 200 is 170 bucks, something like that. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, the, the focus, once it's locked, it's perfect, it's, in, it's fixed in place, it works great. But uh, one thing that I've noticed is that if you don't have this locking knob here uh, set up, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a bit of flex in the, in the focuser, which you might think is fine, except that it's not. Because if you're using this guide scope with the screw here unlocked, you're able to do autofocus fine, right? But that little, uh, little 
thing there lets the system be affected by gravity, which means that if you take long exposures, you'll be seeing some very easily differential flexure, meaning that your guide scope is tracking fine, but because the camera itself sags a tiny bit, effectively you're tracking at a different rate than the main telescope should be tracking, and you get perfect guiding figures, but you do not get perfect stars. At the same time, uh, I've tested with a camera uh, who sh which shall remain unnamed, uh, but which is known for potentially causing vibrations due to its fan when it's cooled. And with the, log the knob unlocked, it seems that the imaging of that guide scope was affected by the vibrations with the knob locked, no problem. So that means that if I use the electronic focuser, I need to find the exact sweet spot between enough locking that I don't have any flex. At the same time, I need the EEF to be able to move without issue against the resistance of the locking knob. I did find that perfect sweet spot, uh, but I feel that maybe with temperature it could change a little bit. So you can see that there's a compromise there. So it's, it's pretty cool. But if I'm going to be using it as a guide scope only, I wouldn't set up the EF. If I'm going to be using this as a super cheap primary telescope, right, to take images with something like the 585 sensor, the 533 sensor, I would say even a micro four third would work fine with this. And then I would really work on finding the right amount of locking here. Or maybe I would use some kind of uh, trick like electric electrician's tape around the focuser tube so that I, I remove that little uh, jiggle that I can find here so that I don't have any issues anymore. So it's actually pretty good as a no, like actually extremely good because it has good optics and you get into nice focus as a pure guide scope without an electronic fix focuser. It's pretty good as a main imaging scope with an electronic focuser and I, I can't believe that the focus actually probably costs around the same price as, as the, the scope itself, but that's something else. And as a visual scope, as a visual scope, it's very nice as well. It works fine, but you're limited by a relatively short 350 millimeters uh, focal length, but that's great for some wide objects like the Pleiades and M42. They looked really nice in this tiny scope, although obviously uh, the aperture isn't quite there, so you're not going to get amazing images. It's basically half of a, binoc of a nice binocular for deep sky. So again, jack of all trades, master of none is kind of my view on this thing. Although when I say mas master of none, I would say master of one guide scope. As a pure guide scope, it's excellent with the stars coming into sharp focus and you don't have like those weird halos around stars. You don't have like blooming around stars. It's like sharp focus. PhD2 locks onto them and it's great. Great as a guide scope and then adequate as everything else. How adequate is it for actual deep sky? Well, let's have a look at the performance of this thing on the star field. I took, I think, uh, yeah, 120 30 second exposures on the Pleiades, so one hour's worth. And I want to show you the results of that with this scope. Let's have a look. By the way, before that, if this kind of stuff is useful to you, please let me know down in the comment. Leave a like it, it, as well. It really helps out. What do you think of this at first glance in the comments? And also, if you want to support the channel and you're planning on buying anything from uh, Amazon, Agena, High Point Scientific, or Tope Tech directly, if you do so after clicking one of the links that I have down below, it will help me out at no cost to you. If you want to become a VIP sponsor of the channel, actually make these videos possible. Thank you so much, guys. You can become a channel member. It's the join button next to the subscribe button or a Patreon supporter. The link is down in the description and the pinned comment. With that, let's go and look at some results for deep sky imaging. Okay, so I did test this under the stars with my cool astrophotography camera, APS-C size sensor from Tech. And this is the result that we get on the Pleiades. This is uh, 120 seconds. No, this is 120 frames of 30 seconds each on the Pleiades. And for now, let's ignore that the flat frames didn't work correctly. I'm going to tell you why in a moment. And let's look at the uh, stars. The stars themselves 
they're slightly elongated at the time I was testing on uh, my super cheap $500 harmonic drive mount, uh, but they look pretty nice, except of course, that on those bright stars, you have quite a large amount of chromatic aberration with those blue halos around the stars, which means that to achieve such a high, such a low price point, it seems that Tech has cut corners on the glass used. Still, it is, you know, for the price, I guess it's fine. If we go to the corners of APS-C, which again, we are forbidden to use <laughs> with this uh, telescope, well, the stars are, you know, it's expected. They're getting less sharp, right? And they're getting elongated. And it's the same at the bottom right. It's the same at the bottom left. It's the same at the top left. But it's honestly not as bad as I had imagined. It's decent and I didn't expect it to be so good on APS-C size format. If we crop down to something that would be more or less the equivalent of one inch, and we zoom in and we look at the corners, the stars at the corner, they're perfectly fine, right? So the uh, one inch recommendation by Tech, if you're going to do deep sky astrophotography with this telescope is absolutely correct. The really only issue I see with the optics uh, themselves is when the stars feel a bit soft, the reason that they feel a bit soft is likely because of the chromatic aberration. So we don't, we don't get every color being uh, focused at the same point. So that's one thing, by the way. And then another thing, and I'm gonna show you like for now the, uh, the, the final image I got, this is just one hour on the Pleiades from Tokyo. So we're using that guide scope. So it's not too bad, but you can see that after processing those like incorrect uh, flat calibration is very visible. And I suspect that this is because at the time I hadn't figured out the perfect tension for the locking of the screw on the guide scope, which means that the uh, flat frames and the light frames, there was a slight angle difference. The, uh, the sagging was different by flat frames. I took them with the scope pointing upwards. And so there was no sagging possible on the focuser. My light frames, I took them obviously pointed at the Pleiades, which means that gravity did its role and it sagged the camera a little bit. And therefore we don't have the perfect alignment of the flat frames to uh, light frames. And I tried again uh, with a few subs on some random region in the, the sky. And this time I locked it down. I locked the screw down and no problems whatsoever, right? So that's where if you're going to use this as a primary astrophotography telescope, you want to be careful about, especially if you're using an EF or an AAF with it, an electronic focuser, because then you could run into such issues fairly easily. Which really tells me that this telescope, well, it's a very low price and it, it's pretty cool that it exists and it can be used for uh, honest to goodness astrophotography, although it has its limitations, I would still use it properly as a guide scope. And also like if, basically I would say, if you're looking for a good guide scope, I would say, uh, yeah, have a look at the 200 millimeters, maybe 250 millimeters version of this because they're less than 200 US dollars. They have triplet optics. They guide very well. The star shapes are nice and in a pinch, you can connect a 533 or 585 camera on them and use them for deep sky astrophotography. It's good for traveling, that kind of stuff. So at that price, for this kind of use case, it's pretty nice. Uh, but if you're primarily looking for an astrophotography scope or you're primarily looking for a visual scope, it's probably not what you should go for. But still, it's a pretty cool option to have that available with this jack of all trades, master of none, except guide scope, pure guide scope um, available. I think at this price, I can't really complain. It's basically a guide scope with additional features on top. If I want to use them, I don't have to. I can use it as a guide scope, but I can go further. I think that's pretty nice, but it really depends on your use case. You really want to be careful about considering those uh, telescopes depending on your use case, especially the 350 millimeters, unless you really hate off-axis guiders, I don't really see 
many use cases where you'd want the 350 millimeters uh, scope as a pure guide scope. Uh, 200 millimeters, yeah, that makes sense. 350, just go for an off-axis guider, right? So it's, it's a very interesting series of scopes. I wonder what the sales are, especially per size. And yeah, let me know what you think down in the comments. While you're at it, you can like the video, you can subscribe to the channel, and if you want to support me even more, planning on buying anything, including one of those guide scopes from Top Tech, Amazon, Agena, Highpoint, etc. If you do so after clicking one of the links down in the description, it will help me out at no cost to you. You can also join the channel as a member or join my Patreon as a supporter. The link is down in the description. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for your support. Don't forget, whenever you can, to look up at the stars. And I'll see you next time.